I'm thankful again for the music here at First Baptist Church. I'm thankful it touches my heart, encourages me. I hope it encourages you, it encourages you and uplifts you. If you say, well, Pastor, I come here all the time and I'm never touched by the music, well, maybe you ought to look at what you listen to outside of church. It's not in my notes, but I could stay there a while, couldn't I? I could stay there for a minute. And I'm glad for the church, the music here, and then what the Lord has brought to us, and the people that could sing, and the choir night was just, choir and orchestra that was spot on tonight. What a tremendous message. Turn the tide. Is there, is there any time, all right, that we can think of that I've been alive that we need God's hand more than right now in America? Turn the tide. And boy, that was just great. So I appreciate that music and appreciate the ministry there and thank you for what God's doing. We try to have a variety of music, right? Different songs will touch different people. And uh, we don't need to just trump the lights and add some smoke and uh, no artificial environment here. We don't need to add a drum set on the stage. That's a question I had when I came here to First Baptist Church. Someone asked me, just going to add a drum set to the stage? Now, no plans. No plans at all. All right, not even on the radar, not on the reservation, okay? Uh, will I ever turn the lights off? Well, sure. We come to the Christmas musical, we'll turn the lights off while the lights on up here. All right, we're trying to worship the Lord, and I believe that the Lord is honored by what happens here and thankful for you as a congregation. I'm glad that we can meet as a church. Thankful for that. I found out this past week that of a number of great churches, and to each their own, each have to navigate this way themselves. Um, there's a, of about 300 churches called, about half of them, good, good churches were not open yet. Right, and they made that decision. That's fine, but I'm glad that we're open. I'm glad I can see your smiling face. You're saying Amen. Thanks for live stream. No, it's a blessing for those who aren't comfortable coming back yet. And once again, no pressure for me. But I'm glad to be encouraged by the people of God in the house of God about a great God. And I'm glad to be here. Turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter number 12 before I get too far off track tonight. Then we'll just be here all night long. You wouldn't want that very much. If I get too far off track, my wife will give me that one look she gives me. Right. You those who are married know that look, right? Like, honey, where are you going? And uh, we're too far off track. The guy's upstairs. Uh, uh, he's done it again. He's gone, off the, he's gone off the rails. Where's he going now? It's not what he sent upstairs, but try to mind the Lord. But Hebrews chapter 12, was continue back where we started two weeks ago. Appreciate Brother Treadway last week. Pre- preached a tremendous message and thankful for that. And I think touched hearts. Was able to share his testimony, what God is doing in their family. What a blessing they've already been here to First Baptist Church. And, of course, I love the family and they... All our encouragement to me, and of course, him as a good friend and his wife, and what a wonderful people. Glad they're here. We're blessed to have them up here. You got to hear from him. If you were not here last Sunday night, all right, then look it up on YouTube or Facebook and listen to it. It's a good, a good testimony of what God's doing and uh, to see the hand of God at work. And, and along the way, I'm sure he'll share some more things of what God did. It's just an exciting thing when God is at work. It's exciting when God works in people's lives. It's exciting to see the hand of God at work in a church and in church families and in God's people. That's what we're looking for, for God to work. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 20 and 29. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Our God is not a match. Our God is not a lighter. Our God is not even a blowtorch or a propane torch or not even a small bonfire. Our God is a consuming fire. This was first presented to the children of Israel. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. So the visual had seen the fire of God in a few distinct ways. By day there was a cloud, by night there was a pillar of, help me, a fire. They had seen the fire of God. Shortly they would see it when it came and consumed to some who had rebelled against the hand of God and the ruler of God. They'd seen it in God's provision. They'd seen the fire in God's judgment. Nadab and, Ab- Nadab and Abihu were going to be burned up with fire when they offered a strange fire. And so when this concept was presented, our God is a consuming fire, maybe it meant a little bit more to them than it does to you or to me. Maybe, just maybe, when they heard this, this phrase, for the Lord thy God, he's a consuming fire, they would know in a few short hours the fire of God would literally and physically be within touch. Yet now we can read Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29. And we know, we know it's true, but, but we forget about it. 
It's lost its blaze. And we looked at a few weeks ago about it's the, the God that is a consuming fire is a God that rekindles. And many of us need rekindling in our life, maybe not today, but probably tomorrow. We have a lot of comfortable Christians. We have a lot of careful Christians. But God is looking for consumed Christians. What does a man or a woman look like when they're consumed by a consuming God? They look like they're all in. They look like a little bit crazier than everyone else around them. Remember this? They look a little bit radical in their views, not in an intense sense, but in a sense that says, wow, you're a little bit over the top. You're not quite in touch with what's going on around you. You're a little bit too zealous. You've got some weird ideas where you come back to church again and again, and you keep on praying. You go back to Daniel, and you see a man who in the face of a decree to be thrown into the lion's den, he goes and immediately opens up his window and prays. A consumed man. God wants us to be consumed. God is a fire. What a tremendous concept. After that first sermon I preached, within I think that Monday or that Wednesday, I think it was that Monday, I built another bonfire at my house. I told you I'd like to build bonfires. I sent a picture to a couple of you. The, the flames were above the roof of my pole barn, Brother Evans. If you've been to my house, it's higher than three feet. I was reminded again about how God wants to be a consuming fire. Yet Christians, friends, those here and online, sometimes we dump water on God's flames in our life. We extinguish what God wants to do. We hinder the ways He wants to burn inside of us. Instead of being a consuming fire, he becomes a small flame. Tonight, as we look again at God being a consuming fire, I'd like to look at how he is a fire that refines. A fire that refines. Lord, I pray you'd help us. I pray you'd help us as we look at your word and listen to your spirit. What I'd ask for help from me as I preach tonight, Lord, I can't preach without you. I've tried to do my part in study, but Lord, these are just words on a page, and I need you. Lord, help me to communicate those truths from your word. If there's something I have maybe in my notes or on my mind to say that would not please or honor you, Lord, help me not to say it. Strike it from my lips. And Lord, help us as listeners to your word to, to, not, to, to not let anything hinder the word from touching our heart. Help us to be good soil, Lord. Do something that only you can do, and that is transform hearts and lives tonight. Lord, we love you. We ask for your help now. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to look at tonight how God's fire is a fire is a fire that refines in Scripture. You see, sometimes we believe or we mistakenly believe that the fire from God, the refining fire, is kind of like a, an unattended blaze in our life. That, that, that God has lit this refinement and then kind of walked away and now there's just a blaze going wherever, however, to whomever, and it just burns needlessly throughout our lives. We, we question whether what God is doing is really with his hand at work or is it just, did he just light the match and, and walk away? I shouldn't tell this story, but I found it to be true like Pastor Led often said, when, he, when I say that, you listen a whole lot better. We like to grill at our house, and uh, about a year and a half ago, my wife decided to grill before I got home. Honey, can I tell this story? I'll take it as tacit permission. I do not tell categorically stories about my wife because she loves me, but this one, because of fire, bears repeating. And I told one about me burning down Pastor Led's forest, so... It might as well, all's fair in love and war, and I'll be sleeping outside. You pray for me, I'll need a fire. I buy, I'll be by the fire tonight. Well, my wife apparently went to, went to grill. Normally, I grill at the house. It's just not that it matters. It's just what I normally do. I enjoy it. And I was running late from work and doing some sure something ministry-related and just delayed or whatever. Coming home, so my wife said, you know, I'll take care of supper. So she got the grill started, put the hamburgers on there, and promptly shut the grill. I got the phone call from her. When she said, honey, we're going to need more hamburgers. Because when she shut the grill, 
the fire consumed the burgers and everything else around it. And no longer were there burgers at the Howell House, there were hockey pucks. <laughs> These things were intense. These things were tough. These, it was like they were diamonds, all right? Somehow she got this fire so hot. These things were like click, 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 click. It's those burgers I got from Sam's Club, I think. You got to be careful. Those things aren't real. They, they, they ain't real, all right? Right, McDonald's, you cook them when they bend. These, boom, like this. And sometimes in our life, we're tempted to think that's what God's doing. That he's put us in the grill, he's shut the lid and walked away. And all he's doing is let us just like, poof. You ever felt that way? You ever feel like the fire's going, but you don't know where it's at? It was a reminder of a story of a fire chief of a small town. Got a phone call. There's a fire. Send the fire truck. Promptly hang up. He said, oh no, what can I do? I don't know where the fire's at. He said, I'm sure they'll call back. A few minutes later, sure enough, uh, this lady called back. There's a fire. The fire's still going on. Send the fire trucks. And before he can say anything, she hangs back up. Boy, now the fire chief's very concerned, trying to get the, the trucks out there. Everyone's ready, standing by. So he thinks, I'll go outside and look for some smoke. And he walks outside the building, and he doesn't see any smoke anywhere in the small town. He comes up with a plan. When she comes back on, I'll ask her. Sure enough, within a few more minutes, the phone rings again. And before she can say anything, he goes, where's the fire? And she promptly responds, in the kitchen, click. <laughs> and often, we feel like God has done that in our life. No clarity. No direction. Our God is a consuming fire, but he's a fire that refines. And tonight, you would uh, turn over to another passage of Scripture. 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. The Lord's fire will either consume us from the inside out or condemn us from the outside in. Our God is a consuming fire. In 1 Peter chapter 1, Verses 6 and 7, where Peter says, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with, it's the next word, fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory. And glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Malachi 3.3 3 says, And he that is God shall sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. You see, God desires to refine me, to refine you as his child. He wants his image to, re to be reflected in your life and in my life. The purpose of refinement is for God to be reflected. Tonight I have just two points that we're going to get to right at the end of the message, all right? So I've got a really long intro. Then I'll give you the two points. So don't get scared when we get there. Know that we're just about done. But I want to pose a few things and talk about a few things. The first thing is this. Why do we reject God's refinement? We know it to be true. We, we know the Bible talks about it. We've seen it in others. We've even experienced it in our life. But why do we reject the fire of refinement? And I offer up a couple of reasons why we reject that. One, we reject it because it hurts. It hurts. It just plain doesn't feel good. And to be honest, we don't like to be uncomfortable. We don't really run to pain. If you stub your toe, you typically don't say, praise God, I'm going to use my other foot now. You say, ow, who put that stupid coffee table in the living room? Oh, honey, you built that 25 years ago. Well, I'm stupid, okay? That's fine. We, we don't like it. And sometimes we reject refinement because it hurts. It seems like God doesn't care. Can I submit that another reason that we reject refinement is because it seems at times, it seems, it appears, only appears, it seems to be unfair. Why am I going through this and they're not. They're not that good a person. I know them. 
I saw them at Walmart yesterday, and they cut in line. God's blessing is not in their life. I saw them on the highway, and they passed me, and I was going 71 miles an hour. They were, obviously, they were way more speeding than I was. And why am I going through this trouble when I know, when I know, I'm convinced I'm a much better Christian than they are? Seems unfair, doesn't it? That's the flesh. That's our minds. All right? That's what we battle with. It seems unfair that I would have to face this refinement, but they wouldn't. It's a good thing that we are not in charge of refining each other, isn't it? Oh, I've got some good plans for you and you for me, don't you? Oh, I know exactly what will refine them or get them. They'd kind of blur the lines in our life, would they not? But it seems unfair at times. Or we reject refinement because it seems unreasonable. Lord, what you put me through is just more than I can handle. It's not reasonable. It's not purposeful. Lord, what you've done doesn't measure up to what I view to be kosher, to be helpful. And, and what you've done is you've stopped me in the grill and you shut the lid and you've walked away. That's unreasonable. We'll walk away from the refining process. We become bitter at the one who loves us and sent his son Jesus to die for us. We become hurt and we become angry at those who love and would love to help. Sometimes it reflects itself in rejection of not only God, but of God's people. We walk away from a tremendous church and church family, a place where you can find support and love and encouragement. I hope you find that here at First Baptist Church because I do. Support from those here, and I've been supported in so many ways, not only through prayer, but through special words and kind notes. And you're wonderful. I'm not just talking because I'm pastor, but I've been here for years. I've been here long enough to know you pretty well, and you know me. It's an encouraging place to be here at First Baptist Church. I know, and some of you are thinking right now, I know what you're thinking. Yeah, but, but somebody one time said something mean to me, Pastor. That's true. Me too. It was probably me. I'm sorry. All right? But we reject refinement because it seems unreasonable. I want you to understand that... I want you to understand why we need refinement. We need refinement because the purpose of every refinement is to remove material that doesn't belong there. Hey, friend, do you have anything in your life that doesn't belong there? Do you have any of the old man still popping up its ugly, nasty head in your life? Do you have that? If we're honest, we'll say, yes, pastor, you know what? I do. I still sometimes fight with a bad attitude or a bad reaction or I'm still struggling with this. There are things in our lives that are not supposed to be there. Can we call them impurities? And we need refinement so we can please the Lord. That's why we need it. We need refinement because we don't, hello, always see things clearly. Right? We don't always see things clearly. I know what they meant. When they text me that. No, you don't. You ever been misinterpreted over a text? Over an email? Sure. Face to face? I know they were talking about me. How do you know that? Well, because they looked at me when I walked in and then they looked back. Got that before. Well, maybe they weren't talking about you. Maybe you're not the center of everyone else's universe. Maybe you don't quite see things as clearly as you ought to, and you need some refinement with that. We need refinement because Christ has promised to perform it in us. That's what Philippians says. He says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. We reject it. We wonder what the purpose is. What does it look like? What does refinement look like? Sometimes we blame a lot of things on God that aren't God's fault. Sometimes we're in circumstances and problems, not for refining, but because we made bad choices. 
Oh, God's really sticking to me in my finances. He's really growing me in my faith. Well, tell me about that. Well, I bought a brand new truck and a new four-wheeler and a new jet ski. And the Lord's trying my faith to make sure I trust Him. No, you're suffering for your stupid choices in life. Come on now. That's what happens. And, and some people have to walk and what do they say? Pay the stupid tax? And we blame God for that. Oh, you know, boy, you gotta, the Lord's working me hard on my house. There's just some problems there. No, your roof leaked for the last 28 years. You never fixed it. Now it caved in. That's not God's fault. He gave you the wisdom now to take care of what he gave you. What does it look like? Oh, I stubbed my toe. God, what are you doing to me in my life? He wants you to use your eyeballs he gave you. There was times in, in refinement. that God places a circumstance in our life that causes us to walk by faith. Get the call from the doctor. The doctor says, that's not that call. <laughs> not that call. In fact, remind, we need to put that screen up there again to silence cell phones in church. They've been ringing lately, haven't they? We were popular people at First Baptist Church. Some of you ring me in church, but I have mine on silent. You're still trying to catch me. <laughs> You get that call from the doctor. Got bad news for you. Gotta walk by faith. It's the call at work, COVID, circumstances that come in our life. Clearly, God's trying our faith. Remember one time that I was giving, my wife and I, we, we I gave since I've been real young. Came to the faith building offering, and I think it was one of those first faith building offerings. My wife and I had somehow miscommunicated about what had happened. And uh, I put some in the offering, and she put some in the offering. I miscalculated, and I realized on that Monday morning that I had about $3 in my bank account. My, my mistake, right? Lord used that that week. It's tough. Like, what am I going to do? Honey, what are we doing? Didn't tell anybody. She knew, I knew. Lord took care of us. Walk by faith. Sometimes it's a circumstance that brings so much hurt and pain that we just have to trust. Sometimes it's a circumstance in which, for no reason, all right, we're trying to walk by faith, we're trying to please God, we're misunderstood, we're misjudged. Have you been there before? You're just trying to do right, and yet you're under attack. For just trying to take a stand, may I introduce you to the men in California right now who are just trying to please God, misunderstood, misjudged, under attack, through no fault of their own. That's a trial by fire, refining fire. Oh, but the goal. Understand that that raw gold is still valuable just not as profitable. During the gold rush days, and just the other day, they found, I read an article, they had found some big pieces of gold worth, I think, I, I want to say the one piece or the pieces were worth about $245,000, but don't quote me. I just found these nuggets, these gold nuggets, raw gold. Still valuable, but, but not as profitable. In fact, many of you ladies are wearing gold. I'm wearing a gold wedding band. But I'm not wearing a nugget around my finger, am I? I'm not just wearing a big rock, am I? It's still valuable, but not always as profitable. I know some raw Christians. Sometimes it's because they just got saved. And it's exciting when someone just gets saved, isn't it? Isn't it exciting when someone gets touched by the power of God and you see them get saved? But sometimes when someone first gets saved, they're not as refined in God's economy as someone who's been saved for a long time. And they still use language that they shouldn't use. They describe the service in terms that we would never use. Blank, blank, blank. That was good service. It's great. You say, oh, now if one of you said that, they said, there's a problem here. Raw. 
still valuable, but maybe not as profitable yet, God will still use it, right? But he wants to refine to make that raw material, those gold nuggets, into something that he can use in a tremendous and a a powerful way. And I am so glad for the fact that God takes us through steps. And I know some raw Christians because they just got saved, but I know some raw Christians, some gold nuggets, who have been saved for a long, long time. And they're still a raw Christian because they've not allowed the refining work in their life. Refining goal. Take something that is raw and make it profitable. Remember a time in college when God was doing a work in my heart. It seemed that every, every time I turned, there was another wall right there in front of me. Ever felt that before? Wall here, wall here, wall here, wall here. Man, God, what are you doing? Refining you. Making you to be better because there's some things in your life that shouldn't be there. We get tired of being refined. We think refined the way we are. Let me give you two thoughts tonight about the refining fire of God. Last week, Brother Treadway read this verse, and we'll read it again, Job chapter 23, verse 10. But he that is God knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Let me give you two thoughts tonight about the refining fire. The first thought is this. Refining removes imperfection and impurities. Refining removes imperfection and impurities. And sometimes we desperately crave that someone else would be refined. Some of you wives wish that your husband would be refined. I want the imperfections and impurities removed from his life. But Lord, don't touch my life. I want it in my kid's life. But as a dad, I don't want it in my life. We want it in other people, but not our own life. There are actions and attitudes that still do not please the Lord. We're quick to excuse someone else's actions, or quick to excuse our actions, and judge someone else's actions. read an interesting study that most people, most people view themselves to be above average. Now, the law of average means that most of us are average. That's what average means. Okay, but upon this study, they went to a college, a couple college campuses, and they found that people would view themselves in every area of life above average. How are you as a communicator? Oh, I'm pretty good. How are you as a student? I'm pretty good. I'm better than the average person. How are you at sports? I'm pretty good. I'm better than the average person. We tend to exalt ourselves. The study went on to talk to the the professors at this university, and you know what the professor said? The exact same thing. How are you as a professor? I'm not an average professor. I'm an above average professor. We tend to view ourselves not as clearly as we ought to. And the point of refining is supposed to remove imperfection and impurities. My friend, do you have any imperfection in your life? It's just me and myself in the mirror. The answer is yes then why are we surprised that God wants to refine it? Why do we get mad when God says, what you already know to be there, what you already can admit when it's just you and me? Why are you upset when I decide to remove that from your life and to make you more like my son, Jesus Christ? Why do we get upset at the refining process when we know, when we know, when we know that we are filled with imperfections? We know. The flesh still lives inside of us. We know that those days, we're like, man, today, huh, I got to apologize. Today, Lord, you weren't first place today. In the 1800s, a group of women, women met to study the Bible in Dublin. The story goes, they're puzzled by the words of Malachi 3.3, 3, and he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. One of the ladies, the story goes, called the silversmith and and asked him to report to them on the the subject. She went there and began to know the process of the refinement, which he began to fully describe to her. 
He began to explain how the heat was, was cautious and, and how he sat by and, and he said, I must sit with my eyes steadily fixed on the furnace for the, if the time necessary for refining be exceeded in the slightest degree, the silver is sure to be injured. In a moment, the lady grasped the concept of what God does in our life. How he sits tenderly by his children. As she was leaving, the story goes, the silversmith called her back. He said, oh, I thought you may want to know that, that I know when the silver's done, when I can look at it and see my reflection back, looking back at me. You know when the refinement of, is done? When God can look at us and see his son reflected back. What does God see reflected in your life or my life? My attitudes are reflected. My personal injuries are reflected. My inconveniences are reflected. My views of politics are reflected. My hobbies and other enjoyments are reflected. But my desire is to allow the refining work of God in my life and my prayer for you to allow the refining work of God in your life so that he removes those impurities so that his son is reflected for all to see. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify you? Of course not. Glorify your accomplishments? Definitely not. Glorify your family? I surely hope not. Glorify your church? Absolutely not. Glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Refining work removes imperfections and impurities. Second of all, last night, the, refi the refining work intimately involves concern and care. See, God cares about you, and He cares about me. He knows the way that I take. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. God cares about the person. God cares about the process. God cares about the pain. In, in this particular study, I looked up what it takes to refine gold. And I found this out. As with silver, if you heat gold up too fast and too hot, it becomes harder rather than softer. And my friend, that's good to know. Because if God were to heat us up too fast, we would become harder rather than softer. His goal is not to make us hard, but soft to Him, sensitive to Him. Don't be tempted to believe that God isn't actively refining you as a Christian. If you're saved, Christ is performing a work in your life. Don't be naive to believe that God isn't carefully crafting the temperature for you. And the temperature that he uses for you may not be the same he uses for the person next to you or the person across the aisle. It may not be the same temperature he uses for me, but he carefully crafts the temperature for his wonderful children so that when he brings them forth, they shall come forth as gold. Carefully refined in His consuming fire. God wants to refine us. He's concerned about me. Jeremiah 18. We read about the potter and the clay. God is actively working. And the Bible sometimes uses different illustrations to get the same point across. The same point is God's doing something in your life. He's concerned about what comes out. He's not looking for bitterness, but he's looking for bo brokenness. He's not trying to bring about pain, but trying to bring about praise. He's not looking to hurt, but for humility and hope. He's not looking just to torment you, but for you to be a testimony. He's not looking for ruin, but for refinement. Allow God to refine you, to make you profitable for his service. You see, sometimes we shorten the refinement. We pull out early. We dump water on the flame. We complain about the refinement, discontentment, and we disdain the refinement. But we need to embrace the refinement. Gold is measured in carats. Not carrots, but carrots. And a gold carrot measures 
the purity of gold. Maybe you know this. There's eight carat gold. Of eight carat, that piece of metal will be 33 and three quarter percent gold. Nine carat is 37 percent. Ten carat is 42 percent. Twelve carat is 50 percent. And 14, 58, 18 is 75 percent. 21 carat is 87 and a half percent. And 22 carat is 91 and three quarter percent gold. But 24 carat gold is 100 percent gold gold. And I wonder tonight, Christian, what carrot Christian are you? Have you allowed God to refine you? Have you stopped Him? Lord, 12 carrots. It's good enough. 50%. Don't touch this area over here. I'm fine with you over here. But I'm not content. I don't ever want to be content. Until God is 100% done. Until 100% of me pleases Him. Now, I won't be done until He comes back. But that's what He says. And He which hath called you, He will perform it to the day of Jesus Christ. That's why James says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire. That's 100%. Wanting or lacking nothing. Our God is consuming fire. He is a fire that refines. And Christian, my challenge to you, to me, is to let Him. Lord, you know what I'm like. You know the imperfections and impurities that I have. Lord, you know what you're doing. Lord, you sure the temperature's right? It feels a little hot down here. Lord, are you still there? It feels like you shut the lid. But we know that He knows the way that I take. Right? When I am tried, I shall come forth as gold. Are you being refined? Are you tempted to run from it, from, to question it? Have you let God work out the impurities in your life? Our God's consuming fire. Lord, I thank You for Your Word. Lord, I thank You for Your goodness to us. Lord, I thank you that you are a refining fire. Lord, you're doing something. You want us to be more like your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we're tempted to run from it. We're tempted to complain about it. Lord, we're supposed to embrace it. Lord, help us. Help us when we feel that you're not being fair to trust you, to believe you. Lord, help us when we think that all is just about hurt to see the hope you give us. Friend, just a moment, we'll stand to our feet. If the Lord touched your heart, would you bend a knee? Maybe you've been resisting what God wants to do in your life. Maybe you've been questioning. Would you embrace it? Embrace his love, embrace his power, embrace his touch. The refiner's touch. Lord, bless his invitation. May we respond to the way that you have spoken to us. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. Just stand to our feet. The piano's already begun to play. I'll say, yes, Lord, yes. The Lord's touched your heart. You respond the way God wants you to. For our God is a consuming fire. He's a fire that refines. Maybe you're online tonight, or you're here. You've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. My friend, the Bible tells us that we're all sinners. The wages of sin is death. But that God loved us and He sent His Son Jesus to die for us. But God commended His love toward us. And that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. You can trust Him today. 
you can pray and ask him to save you, and he will. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. My friend, if you've never trusted Christ, I would encourage you to trust in the night. You can pray a simple prayer. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to pay for my sin. But I believe that you died for me. You buried and rose again. Please save me. I trust in you. You've never asked Jesus to save you, would you? Pray tonight. Simple prayer from your heart. It's not a magic in the words. It's with the heart that man believes. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Tell him. He'll hear you. I know I deserve to pay for my sin. I believe that you died on the cross for me. That you're buried and rose again. Please save me. I trust you. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And him that cometh unto me, Jesus says, I will in no wise cast out. Christ has never turned to anyone away. Would you turn to him tonight? Would you say yes to him? Let's sing that as we close. I'll say yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. I'll say yes, Lord, yes, I will trust you. you'd work in our hearts. Lord, I pray you'd help us as you refine us to stay right where you have us, Lord, knowing that your touch is an expert touch, a master's touch. Lord, thank you that you don't give up on us. You're far more merciful and gracious than we deserve. Lord, thank you for what you're doing to refine us, to make us like your son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray and ask that others would see him reflected through us. Lord, I pray for Saginaw, that Saginaw would see Jesus through the folks that are here and online tonight. That this world would be touched, Lord, because your children have been refined by you. And that they would glorify you. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name.